This lecture introduces the concepts of axial stress and shear stress in the context of truss structures. Consider a simple truss structure. The vertical load placed at the midpoint of the structure causes axial forces to develop in the truss members. These forces are From the engineering statics, we know that each truss member carries a tensile or compressive force. For example, this member is being compressed by an axial force of 50 kN, while this one is being stretched by a force of 30 kN. But how exactly does the force propagate in the solid material? How is the force transferred from one end of the member to its other end? To answer this question, Let's focus on a specific member, say one of the tensile members along the bottom cord of the truss. Suppose the member is made of structural steel. If we visualize the material at the atomic level, we see protons being held together using a sea of electrons. In this illustration, the blue circles represent protons, each having a positive charge, and the red circles are electrons with a negative charge. For our purposes, it would be helpful to think of the electric charges that hold the particles together as mechanical springs. These springs are stretched or compressed when the member is subjected to a tensile or compressive force. When a truss member stretches in tension, the atomic particles are going to be pulled apart, causing a small tension force to develop in each spring. Similarly, when the member is compressed, each spring undergoes a compressive force. Let us focus on a small area on the surface of the cross section of the tensile member. The exact size of this area is immaterial, as long as its dimensions are negligible relative to the dimensions of the cross section. The designated area helps us explain the concept of stress. We refer to it as an infinitesimal area. Acting on this infinitesimal area are a large number of atomic spring forces being developed due to the tensile force in the member. If we add up all of these forces, we get a single three-dimensional resultant force vector. However, given the two-dimensional nature of the truss, we treat the force as a 2D vector with a normal component and a tangential component. Note that the normal and tangential directions of the force are specified relative to the cross-section of the member. The normal force is perpendicular to the cross-sectional surface and the tangential force lies within the plane of the surface. Clearly, the cross-section of the member consists of many such infinitesimal areas, each having a normal and a tangential force acting on it. I am not drawing the tangential forces here, since for an axially loaded member, they are negligible and can be ignored. Generally speaking, this normal force distribution is not uniform. It varies across the area. However, in the case of axially loaded members, we can assume a uniform force distribution. Therefore, we can replace this nonlinear force diagram with a rectangular prism. We refer to this constant force as the average normal or axial stress we use symbol sigma to denote this type of stress. Suppose the cross section of the truss member is 100 millimeters by 50 millimeters. Therefore, the area over which sigma exists equals 5,000 square millimeters or 0 0.005 meters squared. Since the static equilibrium of the truss member segment must be maintained, we can write. Solving this equation for sigma, we get. This is the average normal stress in the member. The average normal stress, therefore, can be viewed as force per unit cross-sectional area of the member. To visualize shear stress, let's start by focusing on the leftmost joint of the truss. Note how the steel bracket sandwiches the truss members at the joint. Also, notice how the steel bolt connects the truss to the bracket, enabling the former to transmit its load to the latter. 
we can see that the 40 kN support reaction at the joint is distributed equally between the two parallel plates forming the bracket. Furthermore, the force interaction between the truss and the bracket takes place through the bolt. Therefore, the fastener is subjected to a force of 20 kN on each side of the truss where it touches each bracket plate. These two forces collectively constitute the support reaction at the left end of the truss. These are balanced by the force that the truss exerts on the pin. Hence, the bolt is subjected to three forces, a downward force of 40 kN in the middle and an upward 20 kN force at either side of the downward force. These three forces, since they are acting parallel to the cross section of the bolt, increase the amount of atomic spring forces in the material in that general direction. If we examine a typical cross section of the bolt closely, we can see tangential forces on the surface of the cross section. Denoted by symbol tau, we refer to these forces as the average shear stress. Generally speaking, Shear stress is not going to be distributed uniformly over such an area. However, since fasteners are small in size, we can assume a uniform tau distribution at a typical bolt cross-section. Suppose the bolt has a cross-sectional area of 700 square millimeters. Since the static equilibrium of the bolt segment must be maintained, we can write this equation simply states that the sum of the forces in the vertical direction must be zero. We can solve this equation for the average shear stress in the bolt. Hence, the average shear stress is shear force per unit area. Now that we are familiar with the concept of stress, let's work on a couple of example problems. Suppose we have an L-shaped truss member made of structural steel. The member is 4 meters long and has the cross-sectional dimensions shown here. There is a hole in one of the legs of the angle in the middle of the member. The diameter of the hole is 80 millimeters. The member is subjected to a tensile force of 100 kilonewtons. We wish to determine the maximum axial stress in the member. To solve the problem, we need to divide the axial force by the minimum cross-sectional area of the member. This area can be calculated by subtracting the area due to the hole from the gross cross-sectional area. The gross cross-sectional area of the member can be expressed as shown here. The area due to the hole that needs to be subtracted from the gross area is the area of a rectangle with dimensions 10 millimeters by 80 millimeters. We can compute the net area by subtracting the area of the hole from the gross area. Now we can calculate the maximum average normal stress in the member as shown here. For our second example, consider a truss member in compression consisting of two angles placed back to back. The member is attached to the base of the truss using two bolts. The truss has been analyzed and the axial compressive force in the member has been determined to be 120 kilonewtons. We wish to determine the average shear stress in the bolts. Given a bolt diameter of 20 millimeters, its cross-sectional area can be written as 100 pi millimeter squared. Since the compression member consists of two angles, we can assume that each angle carries half the force. That is, the axial compressive force in each angle equals 60 kilonewtons. Furthermore, each angle transfers its force to the base member through two bolts. Therefore, we can assume that each bolt is responsible for transferring half the 60 kilonewtons force to the base member. This assumption can be made based on the realization that the bolts are placed in close proximity of each other, which enables us to view the entire connection as a single mechanism for force transfer. The shear force per bolt, therefore, equals 30 kN. The forces acting on each bolt cause tau to develop on the surface of a typical cross-sectional area of the bolt. Knowing the area of the bolt and the shear force that is causing the stress, 
we can easily compute the average shear stress in each bolt. When designing structural members, we need to make sure that the stresses that develop in each member do not exceed the strength of the material. We will discuss this topic in more details in the context of structural design of truss members and connections in future lectures.